Uh, my name is uh, Leni Rasmussen, and I'm substituting uh, this morning uh, as a chair for Morten Skype Knudsen. He will be back uh, in the break. Uh, so we're ready uh, for the first session. We have uh, three excellent uh, speakers this morning. Uh, first, we have Björn Schumacher. Then we have Andrea Meyer. And then uh, finally, before the break, we have uh, Ian Hickson. So the first speaker is uh, Björn Schumacher from University of Cologne. So. All right, thank you, uh, Lena, for the kind introduction. And I would like to thank Martin and Alex for putting together this really amazing meeting. I remember we were in Basel with like 30 people, and now it's the biggest uh, aging conference probably in the world with all the streaming. So it's, it's, it's really remarkable what you guys have achieved. I'm going to tell you today a story about genome stability in germ cells. And I will begin by telling you why we think that this is actually an important issue. Oops. The cause why we age has been essentially set, already re was realized in the late 19th century by zoologist August Weismann when he conceptualized the theory of inheritance. And he was the first to propose that heritable traits are exclusively passed on by germ cells, where they are protected by what is know, now known as a Weismann barrier, barrier from any somatic or environmental influences. And when he realized that germ cells can indefinitely perpetuate the genetic information, and in humans, in modern Homo sapiens, that has happened now in the seven, almost 7,000th generations, over 200,000 years. Our germ cells are, in fact, 200,000 years old. Um, when he realized that germ cells can indefinitely do so, it occurred to him that this immortality of the soma would offer no benefit to, um, uh, no selective advantage. And therefore, the soma can decay, age, and die once the germ cells have transferred the genetic information in the next generation. But there are, of course, prerequisites for germ cells to be essentially a model. And that is the stability of their, ge of their genomes. And this is an important aspect that we are investigating in our lab. There are some constraints on the genome stability control in the germ cells. So I told you already that genomes are indefinitely passed on through the immortal germline. So if any of you might be interested in immortality, just look at the germ cells, see how they do this. Um, the genome stability control in germ cells can indefinitely maintain a species gene pool. Germline mutation rates are in orders of magnitude lower than um, a somatic mutation rates. And um, the germline genomes are maintained by DNA repair and by selection for gametes with the most stable genomes. So selection and repair are the fundamental mechanisms of maintenance of germ cells. The C. elegans system is a fabulous system for not only for doing aging research, but to understand the biology of an organism. And it's because of its simplicity and because many of the mechanisms are highly conserved from this uh, simple animal to us humans. And a particular um, feature of the elegance that is very important for our work is that all the somatic cells, here you see the pharynx, you see the intestine, and in fact, a third of all the somatic uh, cells are neurons. So it's quite a smart animal, in fact. Um, but all these cell types are post-mitotic. They're terminally differentiating, mostly already during early development. And in contrast, the germ cell that you see here is a highly dynamic tissue. It has here mitotically dividing germ stem cells. They uh, transit into meiosis, where recombination occurs in packaging cells, which becomes important for my talk. They form oocytes. They are fertilized in the spermatheca to form the next generation. The highly conserved DNA damage checkpoint mechanisms operating in this germline. In the mitotic compartment, DNA damage, such as induced by ionizing radiation that induces DNA double strand breaks, leads to cell cycle arrest, which can be uh, 
monitored in live animals where you see the appearance of these fewer ger uh, germ cells, they, their nuclei expand as they arrest. In contrast, specifically here in the meiotic packaging zone, where in late packaging cells, that is the stage where normally um, meiotic recombination has been completed. There, the cells that carry DNA damage undergo apoptosis programmed cell death that is regulated through a highly conserved P53 mediated mechanism. And you can see this, you can observe this live in the entire animal. We and others have in the past defined the DNA damage response in these germ cells where DNA double strand breaks are recognized by a highly conserved um, DNA damage sensing mechanism that induces the C. elegans P53 that in a highly conserved manner induces um, BH the only genes in humans, this would be Puma and Noxa, to then trigger the apoptosome that was first discovered in C. elegans. In, in, in fact, apoptosis was first discovered in C. elegans um, and regulates then the germ cell apoptosis. Now, um, Najmi uh, Sultan Mohammadi, um, a graduate student in the lab, together with uh, Xia Wang, um, investigated under which mechanisms this quality control in the germ cells is regulated and whether there are influences from the soma, from the non germline animal, um, to, uh, that impact this apoptotic quality control. And the key discovery here was the role of the P38 stress map kinase that in C. elegans is called PMK1. And as you can see from these images here, under control and upon ionizing radiation, which induces the double strand breaks, we see normally the occurrence of these apoptotic corpses. However, PMK P38 uh, mutant animals fail to induce um, the apoptotic response. The <coughs> PMK1 is indeed uh, uh, activated after ionizing radiation, as you have seen in elevated phosphorylation levels of PMK1. This is the control. Um, and when we monitored here, when we quantified the apoptotic corpse induction after ionizing radiation, this was strongly defective in P38 PMK1 mutants. And also its downstream transcription factor, ATF7, um, mirrors the exact same phenotype. In an unrelated MAP kinase, junk is not involved. Then we looked at the activation. Where is P38 PMK1 activated? And what we found was that specifically in the intestine, but not in the germline, uh, in after ionizing radiation, we see an induction of the phosphorylated form of PMK1. But uh, there's no PMK1 in the germline, although the effect on apoptosis is in the germline. And we can quantify this here. So it's a specific event in the intestine that has an, um, a consequence in, in the germline. Then we ask whether we can rescue this defect of PMK1 in inducing apoptosis by re-expressing wild types, so this is the mutant, this is a deletion mutant of PMK1, when we re-express now with a transgene, the wild type PMK1, only in the intestine, we can see this here, it's GFP marked, we can see it's only expressed in the intestine, we can reinstate the apoptotic response in the germline. We can independently validate that this is an um, intestinal function of PMK1, by using specific RNAi deficiency strains, where we now, um, that, that are defective in RDE1, a mediator of the RNAi machinery, and when we now re express RDE1 either under a germline promoter or intestinal promoter, we can specifically then make the animals RNAi proficient only in that specific cell type. And when we hear RNAi PMK1, we see a, a reduction of germ cell apoptosis after IR. But when we are RNAi PMK1 in the, in the germline, nothing happens. But when we only can RNAi PMK1 in the intestine, then we see the defect in germ cell apoptosis, clearly indicating, indeed, uh, that it's an it's a intestinal regulation of germ cell apoptosis. Now, is that only true when we exogenously induce DNA damage? Here we use a mutant in the synaptonema complex that leads 
to failure to process meiotic double strand break. And therefore, these animals have now elevated levels, here with RAT51 shown, elevated levels of endogenously formed double strand breaks. This leads to an elevated baseline apoptosis. And this elevated baseline apoptosis is significantly reduced when PMK1 is defective, but reinstated when we only uh, reinstate PMK1 function in the intestine, indicating that also endogenous double strand break lead to the require the intestinal input by PMK1. Um, downstream gene of PMK1 that is extremely strongly induced after ionizing radiation is this gene that ha used to have this cryptic name T24B815 that we renamed now to systemic stress mediator 1. It's strongly induced after ionizing radiation but completely dependent on PMK1. No expression, no induction and no expression in PMK1 mutants. Uh, a deletion mutant of CISM1 shows a significant reduction of germ cell apoptosis compared to wild type here, similar to PMK1 mutants. Then we can reinstate apoptosis when we re-express the wild type CISM1 in the CISM1 mutant under its endogenous promoter, and it's even more strongly induced than in wild type. Then we ask where does CISM1 act, and indeed, um, when we now express CISM1 in this mutant, we re-express wild-type CISM1 under a, a constitutive intestinal promoter. This is sufficient to reinstate germ cell apoptosis, and it's also sufficient to constitutively in, um, express CISM1 in the germ cells, indicating that it likely to, is likely to act in the germ cell on apoptosis. We then ask whether CISM1 acts downstream of PMK1, and this is indeed the case. When we here um, uh, use a PMK1 CISM1 double mutant, where each mutant is defective in apoptosis, it's sufficient to reinstate CISM1 in the intestine to restore germ cell apoptosis, indicating it's downstream of PMK1 as expected because it's a downstream gene target. This, the particular interesting thing about this, this uh, protein is that it carries a signal sequence which marks it to the secretory machinery um, and somehow the intestinal signal must um, be transferred into the uh, germline. And so we interrogated that by a range of CRISPR-Cas uh, knock-in strains that we generated, where we initially, in, into the endogenous uh, locus, inserted a V5 tag to monitor um, uh, CISM1. Then we, we exchanged the promoter with a constitutive intestinal or a constitutive germline promoter. And then we used these strains to remove the signal sequence. And indeed, all of these um, knock-ins uh, were proficient in germ cell apoptosis with the exception of the transgene that now con only in expressed CISM1 in the intestine, but without a signal sequence indicating that the secretion is required. Then we can monitor this. So this now we can monitor. This is one single intestinal cell here that you see. And you see an elevated of CISM1 after ionizing radiation. And this uh, protein now co-localizes with a Golgi marker indicating that indeed in this intestinal cell, after DNA damage, it is secreted. After ionizing radiation, we see this in the in induction of uh, CISM1. Um, and we see it in the intestinal cell as well as uh, in the germline. Constitutive expression of uh, in, uh, CISM1 in the intestine also leads to its transport into the germline, which you can see here. However, when it lacks the signal sequence, it is expressed in the germline, but not uh, in the intestine, but it fails then to um, be transported into the uh, germline. Then we ask, so PMK1 is really the major immune effector uh, pathway in C. elegans and an important stress mediator. So we ask whether this role of PMK1 in the intestine could have anything to do with stress signaling. And PMK1 is known uh, to respond to environmental stresses, for example, to heat stress. And what we did in this experiment to interrogate whether there's any uh, stress sensing of the environment that would, uh, that, that would regulate uh, 
P38 uh, mediated apoptosis in the germ cells. We used a brief moment of heat stress. So normally worms um, are happiest at 20 degrees. They tolerate very well 25 degrees, but 35 is a heat stress. So 10 minutes heat stress prior to ionizing ir irradiation. And then we monitored apoptosis. And what we saw was that heat stress does elevate already apoptosis in the germ cells. It strongly exacerbates the apoptotic levels that are um, induced upon ionizing radiation. And this is completely dependent on PMK1. And the PMK1 defect in this heat stress induced exacerbation of apoptosis can be reinstalled when we uh, express PMK1 in the intestine, indicating that the environmental heat stress activates PMK1, and this activation exacerbates germ cell apoptosis. The same goes for cism one Here also, again, we see in the wild type a strongly exacerbated apoptotic response upon brief heat stress, which is dependent, or strongly reduced in the cism one mutants. And we can reinstall reinst that if we rescue cism one either in the intestine or we swap the endogenous promoter for an intestinal promoter. What's the consequence of that? So the consequence of, he, of, a, of a heat stress is an elevated level of aneuploidy in the offspring. In humans, that's, for example, trisomy 21. In worms, that's the so-called high incidence of male phenotype, because um, the, they're also, although most C. elegans are hermaphrodites, there's also males occur when instead of two X chromosomes, they only have one X chromosomes. Then a male is born. And normally there's an extraordinary low frequency of males occurring in a population. But here we see nearly uh, um, between one and two percent of males upon a, upon a heat stress, a transient heat stress. And this is now significantly elevated when PMK1 is lacking. And this can be completely restored when PMK1 is re-expressed in its wild-type form in the intestine. Also, ionizing radiation is sufficient to increase aneuploidy, to lead to aneuploidy. And this aneuploidy level is significantly increased when this apoptotic control of PMK1 is missing. And it can be reinstated. Aneuploidy can be reduced in the offspring when in these animals we re-express wild-type PMK1 in the intestine. So the model that uh, we put forward here is that the, the meiotic germ cells in this key event of quality control of the heritable genomes, they are controlled to eliminate damaged germ cells is not regulated cell autonomously by DNA damage checkpoint signaling alone. Instead, they exert a signal that leads to activation of PMK1, P38 in the, in the intestine. This PMK1 also responds to environmental stress. And we demonstrated this for heat stress conditions. And this leads then to the induction of its transcriptional factors, uh, CISM1, which then, through its signal sequence, is transported into um, the, the germ cells where it controls the induction of germ cell apoptosis. And this um, intestinal control of the germ cell apoptosis is required to prevent the inheritance of aneuploidy, linking an environmental stress to the uh, formation of genomes in the subsequent generation. So what I showed you here today is that P PMK1, P38, in the intestine regulates DNA damage-induced apoptosis in germ cells that this PMK1 responds to environmental stress and germ cell DNA damage to promote the apoptotic response. CISM1 is secreted from the intestine to the germline to regulate apoptosis. The intestinal PMK1 controls stress-induced aneuploidy. And this indicates, in defying what was used to be defined as the Weissmann barrier of a block of somatic and environmental influence on germline genomes, that in fact somatic stress signaling regulates the control of heritable and, um, aneuploidy. The question is that in humans, this heritable aneuploidy 
is evident, uh, for example, in trisomy 21. Now the biggest risk factor for trisomy 21 occurrence is clearly maternal age. But there's an unresolved riddle about uh, a, 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 an association with stress factors that have been shown to actually elevate the risk of the occurrence of trisomy 21, such as psychological stress factors. And it will be highly in interesting to investigate whether the mechanisms that we identified here could play a role in the occurrence of aneuploidy in uh, humans as well. I thank you very much for your attention. I acknowledge the people who did the work. Um, if any of you is interested in this type of work, we have an open postdoc position, and I'm very happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have a question? Yeah, Mark. Hi, Bjorn. Very, very nice talk and very elegant system. Um, I have a question on the germ cells. So you, you talk about this apoptosis happening. Uh, now we know that there are so many type of death modalities. Is this the classical apoptosis we think that is like anti-inflammatory, etc., or germ cells can also undergo additional type of uh, cell death? So this germ cell apoptosis is strictly apopto apoptotic. It's regulated through the apoptosome executed uh, by the set uh, three caspase, and uh, the corpses are engulfed uh, completely engulfed unless there is an exacerbated apoptotic response when the engulfing machinery is overwhelmed. It's actually an interesting question what kind of consequences that would have, but it's the classical apoptotic response. Hi Bjorn, right here. <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you know, the DNA da damage sensing uh, response, this BMK1 dependent, which is really fantastic and almost binary. Uh, so when the ionizing radiation are, are, are eliciting the DNA damage, is the localization of PMK, uh, uh, which is potentially cytosolic, uh, how is that, uh, you know, talking to the DNA where this damage response is occurring? Yeah, that's a very good question. So what we see actually, the activated form of PMK1, the phosphorylated form, is actually um, uh, goes into the nucleus and it's probably part of its activation that it there then regulates the ATF7, its transcription factor, and then its transcription targets. Um, so um, the signal of DNA damage recognition and PMK1 activation, that is non-cell autonomous. So it's actually the recognition is in germ cells, and we can show this in this with this meiotic endogenously formed double strand breaks, which in contrast to ionizing radiation only affects uh, meiotic pacotin cells. And that is sufficient to activate PMK1 in the intestine. So that seemed to be a distant event. But also there are other sensing mechanisms. We showed this previously, for example, that uh, in the intestine, uh, the in intestinal innate immune response, which is also P38 dependent, is recognizing cytosolic, like pathogenic uh, DNA in the intestine, and actually this, this leads to inflammation already in that simple animal, just like it does in, in the mammals. And we'll have the last question. Thank you, intriguing uh, uh, theory and uh, practice. But in women, the main issue for aneuploidy is age. Yes, absolutely. Not yeah. stress. Yes, yes, and absolutely. The, and there is the big question, is it because of exposure to, um, uh, to, to uh, damaging uh, factors, or is it that the bad oocytes remain till later age? Do we have any evidence that this process can and occur in humans and does change with age, with senescence, as you suggest? Mm -hmm. So I think this is a very interesting question. So yeah, to clarify, the major risk factor is maternal age, but there's a body of literature in, uh, for example, from, from psychology that has, has found a significant association with stress factors that in addition uh, play a role here. That's why uh, this could be an, in, a very interesting um, a factor. It is unknown, I think, uh, what influence the aging SOMAR has versus the autonomous effect of the loss of genome quality control in the oocytes. And even that could be linked to uh, the aging soma, which is currently unclear. There's an, a clear association between um, 
uh, between uh, reproductive aging and deneuropair genes. That from uh, human genetics, from GWAS, uh, uh, this has become very evident that deneuropair genes are strongly associated with uh, with age of menopause, for example, um, and with increased age, the oocyte does uh, show elevated DNA damage levels, and so it's very likely that the genome instability in oocytes is the primary cause um, uh, for uh, for aneuploidy, um, and the normally such oocytes would be eliminated by a highly by the exact same apoptotic mechanism it's regulated through tap63 in 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 case of human oocytes uh, through the exact same apoptotic mechanism that we uh, have here in in c elegans and it will be very interesting to identify there are um, uh, some indication that some uh, that that there there can that there's a protection from oocyte apoptosis for example, by luteinizing hormones. So there are some indications that uh, there are non-cell autonomous effectors that play into the apoptotic control of oocytes in humans as well. Thank you very much, Bjorn. <laughs> and now the next...